Okay, it's not just a book we call the Word of God. It is God speaking to us. I mean, it, it is what it says it is. Um, Okay. First one is to find fault with the word of God. And if you do not believe it, if you don't believe it, you don't believe God. There's a yeah. I mean, people try to explain away a lot of it. I mean, they try to. I don't say they can. Um, they. Um, they say it, they don't believe God. Right. Right. And then also, what about when we read what the Bible says and then don't do it? Are we really saying I don't believe God? You know, or I, what are you saying you're a cursed human being from heaven? Well, I mean, you know, we, we, we look at it, I and mean, we have a choice to make. I mean, it, it, it claims to be, it proves itself to be what it is, the Word of God, and we have a choice whether we're going to believe it and a choice whether we're going to obey it. I and mean, it's one thing to, to know something. It's another thing to do something about it. Uh, you know, you may have a leaky faucet at your house and you go you know that, that faucet's leaky it needs to be fixed and then it goes on month after month and then finally it gets bad enough you get a water bill it's like whoa that really needs to be fixed and then you do fix it i mean there's one thing about knowing it and then heeding it and um, if we truly believe what it is what it that it is the word of god we need to know it and we need to heed it and take it to heart. But a lot of people do not, some, some people don't believe it's God's word. They try to disprove it as the word of God, but it endures on. Others will believe it to a point. They know it's God's word, but as far as really taking the initiative to apply it in their life, they don't. Uh, do what? We're weak human beings? Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, the way to get stronger is to draw closer to God. But I mean, again, some people don't do that. I mean, if we, the thing is, if we acknowledge the Bible as the Word of God, well, if we acknowledge God as God, we're accountable. If we acknowledge the Word of God as the Word of God, then we realize I'm accountable to what's said in this book. And, and a lot of people don't want that accountability, or they realize, boy, it's going to change my life. And they, they don't think about, I'm, it's going to change me in the sense that I'm saved, but it's going to change me in the sense uh, there's certain things I can't do that I like doing, or I can't act in a way I, that I've been acting anymore. And they realize there's some demands made there, and, and some don't, for whatever reason. Or maybe it's going to cause them some problems in the sense of, you know, I've got, you know, may, being married to someone that's not going to be happy with you, or being at a, at a workplace where they're not going to like the fact that, that you are a Christian or whatever, and so some pull away from, what, whatever the case may be, we're supposed to receive the Word of God as it is, the Word of God. It's the truth, and it works in us in an effective way to those who believe. This first scripture that we're going to look at is John chapter 20. It's after the resurrection, and um, the first day of the week, Jesus had risen early that morning. You had some of the reports coming back in from some of the different ones that, that Jesus was not in the grave, it was empty, that, and that he had appeared to some, and you know they're trying to figure out what's going on. Is Jesus dead or is he alive? What, what's happening here? And they're gathered together in John chapter 20. And the text picks up a verse 19, our lesson text. And let's see. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. So they're kind of hit out, aren't they? I mean, you know, they're, they're there. Why were they afraid? Well, they killed Jesus. And I mean, you know, you, you think about it, they probably thought, if anybody's going to die, it'd be one of us. It won't be Jesus. I mean, because you think about the power that Jesus had, the authority that was his. But what they didn't understand was he died because he gave his life. I mean, it, it, he could have he stopped them if he wanted to, but he didn't stop them because it was God's plan. And so they're, they're worried what's going to happen. If they got in Jesus, they're going to come after us next. And they're, they're afraid, and, and they're discouraged, and they're confused. And Jesus, first thing he says is, peace be with you. Hey, it's okay. You can have peace. It's, it's, I'm, I'm here. And then he showed them his hands. He showed them his side. I mean, he still had those identifying marks there um, and 
show them, look, you know, it's, it's me. Here's where I was pierced. Here's, here's, here's where I was pierced in my side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And so he's preparing them, you know, with, with the great commission, going to all the world, preach the gospel. He said, look, I've been sent from the Father to come to earth with a mission in mind to seek and save the lost. Now I'm about to send you on that mission to go out and, and to seek and save the lost. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. You know, they're being commissioned for a, a great work. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And the, of course, the Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth. And we'll see that a little bit more as we look at some of these other scriptures as well. But he said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So what's he saying to them by, that, by saying that? Receive the Holy Spirit, and if you forgive, sins are forgiven. If not, they're, they're retained. Yeah, um, yeah, in Matthew 16. Yes, I mean, yes. Well, now we go, and we're going to see a little bit more specifically with the apostles, like on the when, it, when, um, when they fully received the Holy Spirit in the sense of what we say, usually say the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, that um, you have the, the tongues like a fire, the sound like a mighty rushing wind. You see them being able to get up and, they didn't have to really worry about what they were going to say or understanding. The Holy Spirit gave them the ability to be able to know what to say and how to say it and then what to write and how to write it as well. And, um, and so, you know, we receive the Holy Spirit, I think, in a, a different sense. Now, we can't go out and lay hands on people and they perform miracles. We can't go out and perform a miracle. But... Uh, We've talked some, of some already about what the Holy Spirit does in our life, but in this case, looking at the Holy Spirit as inspirer, I mean, he's, gonna, he's saying, you know, here's to these apostles, they have a special place in the early church as far as the authority that they have. Um, you know, they didn't have the completed word at that time. They could, they could perform miracles. They could lay hands on others so they could perform miracles, and, and they could explain to other, you know, the truth of God's word. And, and with that authority, it didn't say they can make up their, their own law, about what's right or wrong or, you know, or, or what to do to be saved or, or forgiving sins. They could just go out and say, well, your sin's forgiven you. Your sin's forgiven you. No, I don't like you. Your sins aren't forgiven. That's not what he's saying. But it's according to God's will, according to the Spirit's guidance that's there. But the apostles had uh, a special position there in the um, infant church. And today we do not have apostles in that sense. I mean, we have elders over individual congregations, again, under the oversight of God. But we have the completed word now, I think, that has come in there, and it tells us about forgiveness of sins, for instance. It tells us how to get forgiveness of sins or what, or what will happen if we're not a Christian as far as our sins being retained. And so we have, I think, the Holy Spirit helping us, strengthening us. We talked about helping in our prayer life as well and doing different things. But ultimately, the, the Holy Spirit gave us this word that we need to dig into and learn from and learn what to do to, um, in order to be saved and go to heaven. And so you go down to verse 26. Um, after eight days, his disciples again were inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came to the doors being shut and stood in their midst and said, Peace be to you. And so he's appeared to them again that they're seeing Jesus. They're realizing he has risen from the dead. He's offering to them peace. I mean, he did that to to, to some of them and then to Thomas a little bit later as well. And I think we get over to, um, well, John chapter 16, go back a little ways before his crucifixion. John 16, beginning in verse 13, where he says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take up what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said to him, he will take of mine and declare it to you. And so Jesus had promised that the Holy Spirit was come. Now he's saying, receive the Holy Spirit. And they'll ultimately receive that, the baptism of the Holy Spirit just a little later on the day of Pentecost uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And... Um, 
because he does tell them, you know, you go and wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes, you know, comes upon you. And they wait there. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes on them. But the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, not teaching different things, not, you know, not one fighting against the other. Or Well, Jesus said one thing, the Father said another, the Holy Spirit said something else. All together, on the same page, all together, as far as doctrine is concerned, teaching is concerned, revelation is concerned, Jesus did not reveal everything to them because when he was here on earth, they weren't quite prepared for it. They didn't understand his death on the cross or immediately accept his resurrection until they saw for themselves. But once the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were able to put all the pieces together. Remember everything Jesus had said because he had prophesied his own death, burial, and resurrection on a number of occasions. And... Um, you know, they could look back on that and realize, hey, that's what he was talking about here. Or this is what the Old Testament scriptures were prophesying about. And then it said the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. And we have a lot of doctrine that's revealed throughout the New Testament to us. We have all truth. And Jude said it's, you know, we have the faith that's been, you know, basically it says for one, one time, for all time revealed to us. I mean, it's been, it's been revealed to us through the pages of God's word. But they were promised that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And now... He's, he's laying the foundation for that as well. And um, it will come back to that in just a moment because we end at 2, um, 2 Timothy 3. Well, well, in fact, let's, let's go on over. Let's go ahead now because it's not on our scriptures. Let's go to Acts 2. Acts 2. I'm trying to decide which way is the best way to go. Um, well, in fact, let's go back to Acts 1. And um, Acts 1 and verse 4. And being assembled together with them, talking about Jesus, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the full baptism of the Holy Spirit would come on them soon after this, he's saying, not many days from then. And so they're trying to figure it out. You know, they're still thinking about that Jesus was going to set up this earthly kingdom and, and restore the, that it was time for him to restore the kingdom to Israel. And he said, look, that's not important right now. It's not for you to know that the times or seasons which the Father has put into his own authority. I mean, you're asking questions now. You'll understand it later when you should receive the power, but you should receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you should be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll understand. And, and so they waited. Uh, they, they had an apostle to take um, Judas's place. Matthias is added to the number. And then in chapter 2, talking about the, the apostles, 11 plus 1, the 12, and in chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. It's the sound of a wind. It didn't say that it was actual wind, but sound of a wind. There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, as of fire, not necessarily fire, but looking like it. But you can hear that sound. You can see those tongues um, sitting, sat upon each of them, talking about the apostles. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So you had them being able to speak in a language they didn't know. And um, the Holy Spirit told them how to speak in that language. I mean, it'd be like if you've never spoke French before and all of a sudden you can speak fluent French. And they're able to do that. And that's important because these people from all over the world have come to Jerusalem and now they can hear in their own language God's word being taught. And it, it names, it says, um, the multitude came together and they heard them speak in their own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And he lists all those different nations and, and languages. Which others didn't understand. And what do you do when you don't understand something? You just mock it. Oh, they're full of new wine. They're drunk. And, of course, they weren't drunk. They were speaking with the Holy Spirit, with the power of the Holy Spirit. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, Let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Um, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he, he gives Joel's prophecy about the Spirit being poured out and about you know, the, you know, just great things that would be happening, using prophetic language there. And in verse 22... He said, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. 
whom God raised up. And he goes on and explains and talks about David's prophecy as well. But he's saying, look, you meant evil, but this is God's plan for your salvation. And he gives not only um, Joel's prophecy, then he gives David's prophecy as well. And he just said, um, verse 31, David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh seek corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we were all witnesses. So they preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were witnesses to it. And he, he, he said he's seated at the right hand of God in heaven. Then verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know as surely that God has made this Jesus whom he crucified both Lord and Christ. I mean, he cut them to the heart, some of those people, and they wanted to know what shall we do. In other words, they believed in Jesus. What do we need to do? And he tells them, Peter said, Repent and be baptized. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference there between that gift of the Holy Spirit and the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit that's given. I mean, that, again, the, the apostles were endowed with special abilities. But he said, but the, as far as the other, as far as the plan of salvation, about the purpose of Christ dying, about um, believing, repenting, being baptized, have the remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, he said, this promise is to you, to your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And so we read the rest of it. He continued to preach to them. And that day 3,000 were baptized. And the, of course he goes on and says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so beginning at this point, you have them, uh, the Holy Spirit through those apostles um, revealing God's word and God's will to man. They're preaching with authority of God through, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit. God's will is being revealed. Let's go over to 2 Peter chapter 1. And Peter, years later, is looking back at this and talking about what took place here and explaining to them, you know, you go back to when he preached that first gospel sermon and many sermons since then and the other apostles did as well. He said, I want you to understand what happened when that happened. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12 he says, for this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of, the, of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. He said, yet I think it's right as long as I'm in this tent to stir, up, to stir you up by reminding you. And so he said, look, I, I'm going to remind you again and again and again of these things. I mean, some of the basic foundation, the foundational teachings of the gospel, he said, you need to be reminded. And we don't need to take it for granted either. I mean, we may truly believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, believe the Bible's God's word, but don't take it for granted that your children will automatically believe that, instill that into their minds and their hearts from generation to generation. Get them to understand, as you do, I mean, you know, as you understand that this is God's word, that it is our authority. And we need, you know, I appreciate the, the, those that teach our little ones, and you know, and then we teach them at home as well. Um, to, so that they'll believe the same thing. But Peter said, we need to be reminded again and again and again. And in verse 16, he said, here's why. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You ever heard somebody say that it was just all made up? Why would the apostles, if they had made it up, why would they have made it up? Why would somebody want to make up all this story and claim he's the son of God and claim that they're apostles or whatever? What would be a purpose in making it up if it's not true? Okay, okay make themselves known. Okay, power. If they can get people to believe, if, if it's not true, now, I'm, again, I'm not... They couldn't do a miracle and prove. Right. Oh, I mean, yeah, that's the, that's the thing we'll get to. They, they could have made, if Jesus, if they'd been following Jesus and, and everything wasn't true about him, and then he was nailed to the cross and died, and they go, what are we going to do now? Well, you know, Jesus isn't here anymore. Let's make up a story about him rising up from the dead. And then we can continue on. He's up in heaven now and reigning in heaven. And they can make this story up and still have a following follow after them. Think about the power you could have, the authority you could have. And, and to some people, they go, oh, that makes sense. Oh, that didn't, you know, he, Jesus, well, some will say he, maybe he died, didn't rise up. Others say, well, he wasn't dead and he just kind of swooned. <laughs> 
but I, I, I'm sorry, but if you've been nailed to a cross for hours and your side's cut open and all that, you're not going to just swoon. I mean, it's going to be more than that. But the thing is, if that is true, that they made it up, Billy's already said they couldn't do the miracles that they did. They could be easily disproven. Um, in, um, in my lesson, my sermon this morning, one of the stories we're going to look at is... Um, where they bring Peter and John before the authorities because he had, um, he had healed that man and, and he did it in the name of Jesus and the lame man could walk. And, and they're conferring and they're saying, look, you know, we can't deny the miracle. Um, what can we do to get, to get them to hush up? Because we can't deny a notable miracle. You know, too many witnesses here. And, and so they acknowledge the miracle. If they made up the story, they couldn't do the miracle. Plus, if they had made up the story when they started killing off the apostles, what's the easiest way not to get killed? Stand up and say, look, we made it up. You know, Jesus really is dead. I'll show you where we hid the body. Uh, you know, I'll tell you the whole thing that we did what, here, and they could have denied their faith because, you know, you might die for something. You, you'll die, you know, you might be willing to die for the truth or what you think the truth is, but if you know it's a lie and you know that you made up the lie, I mean, are you willing to give your life for a lie. Are you willing to go through all the persecution that those apostles went through for a lie? He said, look, we didn't make it up. And it doesn't make sense that they made it up because, I mean, did they have prestige, fame, and fortune? No. I mean, they, they had a tremendous weight upon them with the authority that was given to them, a great responsibility. And you had forces from the government, forces from um, the Jewish religion, that fought against them, the pagan world as well. I mean, you had it from all sides. And then from within the church as well, you had people that would question their authority at times. And Peter said, look, we didn't make it up. It makes no sense that we made it up. It wasn't a cunningly devised fable. We're telling you what we saw. And as Billy said, they backed it up with the miracles that they performed, the eyewitness accounts, and you had the gospel accounts there, uh, uh, the different ones that are witnesses to the resurrection. I mean, we, we see that. We see as well at the... The scripture that we read a moment ago from John, we see it in, in Acts as well. The witness to the resurrection is there. He said, we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God, the Father, honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, and, Peter James, and John had gone with Jesus up on the mountain, and who appeared to Jesus? Do you remember? The two Old Testament figures. Moses and Elijah. And they talked together. And, of course, Peter got the bright idea to build, what, three tabernacles? Let's, let's honor all three of him. Jesus, I'm putting you right up there with Moses and Elijah. I mean, Moses, the one that the law was given to, the Ten Commandments, the tables of stone was given to that led Israel. Um, Elijah, representative of all the prophets, and you think about all that Elijah had done, Jesus, you know, you're right up there with those. But what happened then? The voice of God spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I mean, it's Jesus, not Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah were important. They were godly men, but they prepared the way for Christ to come. You know, you look at the promise made to Abraham of a seed to come. You look at the law and it's all looking forward to Christ coming, a shadow of what was to come. You look at the prophets prophesying about the coming Messiah and his kingdom. And, and Peter needed to understand, we need to understand, Jesus wasn't just a great man and a great prophet or a great religious leader. He is the Christ, the Son of God. And Peter said, look, I learned, I understood. I understood. He, he is not on a level with Moses and Elijah. He is greater than Moses and Elijah. You know, he's God in the flesh. And he said, God... The Father put his seal of approval on Jesus, and we are witnesses to that. We heard the voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so and he said, we heard the voice. We heard it with our own ears. We saw it with our own eyes. The glory, you know, Jesus uh, shining forth and, and um, the others fading away. And he says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. He said, you go back to those prophets. They prophesied that, the Messiah would come and you look at the, the prophecies of Daniel and you can get it down to the time of the Roman Empire. You look at the uh, prophecies of Isaiah and you, the virgin birth and you can talk about being 
born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. You can look at prophecies concerning his ministry and then about his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, he said those prophecies were made a long time ago over a period of many, many years. And um, he said in all of that, it's been confirmed. You know, on page 125, for those who have a book, it says, talking about the Word of God, it says the Bible contains 66 books. 39 books are in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. These were written over a span of some 1,600 years. Approximately 40 individuals wrote either entire books or portions of Scripture. Some of these individuals were highly educated. Moses was raised by the daughter of the Egyptian Pharaoh and no doubt received the best education available. Paul was trained by the foremost Jewish rabbi of his day. Others, however, received little of any formal education. Amos was a farmer. Peter and John, fishermen by trade, were uneducated and untrained. Nevertheless, the product of these various individuals is both cohesive and coherent. In other words, despite being produced over many years by individuals from diverse backgrounds, lacking the ability to confer with one another, the Bible stands as a unified work that is not self-contradictory. The only reasonable explanation for this incredible fact is the involvement of God. And, and so he's saying, look, you, you look at how it all fits together. There, there's not contradiction there. I mean, some try to find contradictions and mistakes in the Bible. But there are explanations that are there and that we can, if we understand it properly and, um, and put it together properly. And so he said, Peter says, when you begin to look at it, he says, when we look at Jesus, we see the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophets. Jesus Check, check, check on, on every one of them. Didn't miss a one. And so he says, and God put his seal of approval on as well. In fact, Jesus quoted from the Old Testament scripture. I mean, he, he quoted from the Septuagint and version. And so he really put his seal of approval on what the scriptures had to say and, and argued from them for truth. And then God puts his seal of approval of the Father on, on the Son as well. And he said, when we heard the voice that came from heaven, we were with him on the holy mountain. So we had the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in dark, a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. He said, now, if you don't get it, let's go a little bit further. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. What does that mean? No scripture is of any private interpretation. We let the Bible speak. Uh, another word that's used there as well, it can be of, of any private origin. You know, it doesn't come from God. Um, well, it, that, that is a very good point because you change it to where it's interpretation. What our people have used this passage to say, well, you can't, you don't know enough to interpret the scripture. We will interpret it for you. It's not of your private interpretation. Right. Okay, yeah, this, this, yeah, like you say, this scripture, when it says uh, interpretation, and again, I have a footnote, you can go back, you can go back in the original, the idea is it doesn't come from man, it comes from God. But now that turns around as well, and we, and there's other scripture that tell us we don't add to it, don't take away from it, because it is God's word. But you as an individual, I as an individual, can open it up and read it and understand it. Now, at times we may need some help. I mean, the Ethiopian eunuch said, I need somebody to kind of guide me. And, and it's good to have somebody else sit down and talk with you about the Bible, but it still comes back... I can understand it, you can understand it. Like I said, that has been abused by the Catholic Church, for instance, you know, where you have to have somebody else to interpret it for you. And here, it, you know, we're telling you what it means, even though what they may say is totally different than what God's Word says. But he's saying, look, it, it's God's Word. It comes from Him, and we accept it for that. Uh, I know the book of Revelation at the end, Revelation 22, 18, 19, said you don't add to or take away from the, the things that are said in that prophecy, in that same idea is carried on through the scriptures. Galatians 1 said there's not going to be another gospel. Um, there, we have the gospel that's been revealed. And he said, look, just take the, the Bible for what it says. We, it tells us where we came from. tells us why we're here. It tells us where we're going and how to get to the proper place in eternity as well. And he says, prophecy never came by the will of men. Man, 
but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I mean, some of those people were going about their, their own life and God called them to be a prophet. Um, and you think about the grief that they received. So many of those prophets in the Old Testament were persecuted because people didn't like what they had to say. Um, I mean, it wasn't that, oh, I'm just going to make up this and go tell this. There were, there were false prophets. But, you know, the false prophet would usually tell the king, oh, yeah, you're great, you're great. You know, go ahead, go to battle. God's going to be with you. You know, whatever the king wanted, he'd tell him. But a true prophet would tell it like it was or tell it like it is. And he said they, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So all scripture comes from the Holy Spirit. And let's go on over to one other one before our time runs out. 2 Timothy 3. It's probably the one we think of the most when we look at that. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I mean, we'll go back to um, verse 13. 2 Timothy 3, 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We have that today, don't we? But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Look, Timothy, you've been raised up on the scripture. You know the scriptures. And we have the completed word of God today. And many of us here have been raised up on scripture. You know, I can remember from, the, the, from as far back as I can remember being taught God's word. Uh, others may not have had that, but you hopefully have learned. I know you've learned the scripture and, and studied them. And he said they, they make you wise for salvation. It's the scripture that tells us about salvation. Many people want to go on their feelings or their emotions or think that the Holy Spirit guides in a way that's totally opposite than what God's Word says. But he says you can know from the Scriptures how to be saved. They know that Jesus died for you, the sacrifice for our sins, to know that we're lost and dying in sin, but that we can come into contact with the blood of Christ and, you know, we're buried with Him, rise up in newness of life, and we walk in the light and on it goes and tells us how to do those things. It says, in fact, all scriptures given by inspiration of God, it is literally God breathed. And in our book, it says, you know, the, the Holy Spirit guided these writers. It says this process is commonly referred known as inspiration, although the individual authors retain their unique vocabularies. It says, for instance, um, Luke used the term for a needle used by a physician rather than a common term. Uh, they kept their styles of writing and freedom of expression. Paul included personal requests in his letters. But the Holy Spirit worked with the writers to ensure that the very words chosen were exactly what were needed. The inspiration process also ensured that the message conveyed, conveyed was both complete and accurate. So, I mean, you know, you can look at certain writings and say, well, that has the style of Paul or of t of whoever else that's written. But it wasn't their words. I mean, it, was, it came from God. The Holy Spirit made sure that what was written was, written, was, what, was needed, what needed to be written, all that needed to be written, nothing more, nothing less. The Holy Spirit as well made sure it was the truth. I mean, some people say, well, it's kind of like Shakespeare was inspired. No, I mean, God didn't just get them excited and say, well, I'm going to write something. No, it was the Holy Spirit guiding them as they wrote those words down. Also, through the, the vessel of a human writer, but still it's, it's the perfect word of God. And it says it's profitable for doctrine. You know, how, how do we know what to teach? You know, what our teachings as far as uh, worship or salvation or Christian living, whatever it may be, or uh, we're talking about God, we've been studying the Godhead. We go to the scripture, that's where we get our doctrine from, for reproof. You ever get reproved, you know, or corrected? You know, here's a person that's out there living rebellious sin, they need to be reproved. There's somebody that's doing things they shouldn't do, maybe unaware or whatever, or um, just a weak Christian, you can need to correct them. There's times we need to be told no. You know, some, some parents don't like to tell their children no, but we as children of God need to be told no, and we are told no at times. But there's instruction in righteousness, whether it's a, you're talking about the true righteousness that comes from God through the blood of Christ or righteous living on our part as well. The Bible tells us all these things. I mean, that's where our doctrine, our teaching, our <clears throat> thou shalt and thou shalt nots come from, that the man of God may be complete. Some will say perfect, you know, talking about mature. If you're complete, you know, you complete a jigsaw puzzle. Well, that's nice. It's finished, isn't there? No more pieces to put in there. We are complete. What do you mean? Thoroughly equipped for every good work. It gives us all that we need for every good work. And I meant, you know, not 
We don't have a thou shalt or thou shalt not on every single decision we make in life, but there's principles that are laid out that will help us. Like seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Uh, that, there's a principle there. And, and as we make decisions, it's based on am I really putting God first in this decision, in his kingdom? Am I putting my spiritual life above the other things? But, I mean, it helps us in every good work. It thoroughly equips us. It provides for us in everything that we do. Thoughts on that? I mean, I, you know, that should go without saying, but that's so important because you will get, like we was talking about the Catholic Church earlier where you say, you know, you can have um, the Pope or some of the priests that can interpret the Scripture, and they'll tell you things. They'll make decisions, and, um, you know, the, the Pope that's there now, he's making some interesting decisions along the way as far as, um, you know, um, with homosexuality, for instance, gay marriage and different things, and, 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 and accepting certain things that the Scripture says don't accept and yet they are because he interprets it the way he wants it to be and and whatever else what's interesting though is you'll have one here they'll say that then 50 100 years later you have another one to say something totally opposite than what he did and yet they're all supposed to be telling you the truth but truth does not contradict truth does not change and so and it doesn't take just the catholic church i mean i was mentioning them but you can look in many religious groups and see the same thing. You can look within the church and see people that have gotten away from God's word and, and what it says because we want to be like, we need to make the world like Christ, not the church like the world. You know, the church must be like Christ, not like the world. And, and sometimes we try to become like the world to win the world and we're not supposed to do that. We go into all the world, but we're in the world, but not of the world. And, and so he says, look at the, what the Holy Spirit has done. Now, we have to open up the pages of God's Word to learn truth. It's, it's there for a purpose. We don't just pray and say, God, give me truth. And then we want Him miraculously to, to reveal His will to us or just open our head up and pour it in or just um, wake up one morning and you have all this knowledge. You have to study God's Word. But we do so praying for wisdom and praying for understanding, praying for God's help in that. And God does. I mean, you know, God does help us and, and lead us through that. But, um, but again, the importance of the Bible, don't discount it. You know, we, we don't, I, think, I say we in general, don't always appreciate it as we should because I was in my office the other day and I can't remember which one of the granddaughters in there. I said, look, up, I got to look at that one bookcase. I was looking and they asked about the books on there. I said, that whole, all those shelves right there are just different Bibles. And they go, why do you have so many Bibles? I go, you know, really, I don't know why I have that many Bibles. Uh, I said, used to, they didn't have it. You know, you, know, you can look up everything you want on the Internet for different versions and stuff. But I said, it's to, and I tried to explain to her about different versions and stuff. Uh, but anyway, it's easy to take it for granted because it's so readily accessible. But whether you have one copy or a hundred copies, don't take it for granted. Well, it has a purpose, you know, there's different laws given in the scripture. I mean, you go back to patriarchal age, mosaic age, and Christian age, and we're in, in the Christian age today, but there's a purpose for all of it and respect it all, and it's written for our learning. But like you say, as far as the authority, you know, what law are we under? Um, those that will be in the class next week, the new class books up here, we are starting a study of Esther. So we kind of switched gears. Do what? We're done with this book. Yes.